thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, like the advertisement said, we're going to talk about kind of our top five issues when it comes to creating diversity, equity, and inclusion within um, ACEs initiatives. And so um, today we're going to outline those five and we're going to talk about some solutions. And this is really a time for us to have a discussion internally. Um, so we have a lot of uh, ACE Connection staff present. Uh, and then we will also open it up to, to you for any comments and questions that you may have as we progress as well. If you have questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat at any time, but there will also be some time towards the end um, to have some Q&A. Uh, and so the reason why we decided to have this session is really to share our internal process. Uh, we have a race and equity work group here at ACES Connection that we have been um, working really since 2018. Uh, of course, 2020 kind of accelerated, accelerated our work, but since 2018, we've had this work group um, that is focused both internally on our own practices as a company, uh, as a nonprofit, and then also externally as we provide awareness and resources to the public. So, um, so let's start with our, our top five. The first one um, that I think that we all agreed was pretty pervasive uh, in our work with um, other initiatives and also um, the members of ACES Connection is uh, the dreaded one-off meeting and trainings. Um, a lot of the work around this issue is a one training or one meeting, and then we say, boom, we have done our DEI work. Um, and this is something that's probably uh, very familiar because this is also how companies and organizations often treat trauma-informed work. Uh, they think that since they've done one training or they've had one meeting, um, that now they consider themselves trauma-informed or trauma-aware. And so this is something that I believe is uh, a very real issue. Uh, it is uh, limiting in its scope in that, um, you know, DEI work is a, is a journey. It is not a one-off mission. It is about challenging ourselves to push ourselves outside of our, our, of our normal state. Um, and so I want to um, reach out to our staff to see if they have any examples of how this has gone wrong in their work. Hi, I'm Carrie Sipp. I'm the Southeastern Regional Community Facilitator for ACES Connection. And um, being in the South, uh, I mean, well, anywhere, uh, people will, you know, host some type of a, a, a one day seminar or um, workshop, or I think truly, and I think we're on the staff pretty much all in agreement that the idea of Black History Month is a one off. You know, uh, let's take this one month out of the year and then we can just ignore it the rest of the time. And, you know, but because we've, um, you know, posted an article or two or maybe we put one up on the bulletin board or we shared it out. Oh, pat ourselves on the back. What a good girl I am. Um, that's my bit for 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 Black History Month and for um, equity and, and fighting racism. And that is so not it. That is just like if you're very sick and you have a very deep infection and you take one of your antibiotics and you think, I'm done. Um, so that's that's how I would kick this off. It's not a one and done. Thank you, Carrie. Um, any additional comments from any staff members around the, the dreaded one-off meeting or the one-off training? Well, I will say that um, in my own personal experience, um, this has been something, especially as a consultant, when people ask me to come in to talk, I will often tell them up front that it, that it is a journey and that if you want to start the journey around diversity, equity, inclusion, that it is something that is ongoing, that it should be a part of a, of a plan, um, even monthly, quarterly, weekly. Here at ACES Connection, our race and equity work group meets every week. And so um, I will say that the one-off meeting or the one-off training 
uh, is very detrimental to any type of DEI work that you want to do as an organization. Um, our next one, number two, is going to be an overall lack of leadership around DEI work. And so this can be twofold. Um, most of our uh, understanding within organizations come from our leaders, our steering committees. Um, if they don't have a background in DEI work, then it's going to be difficult for that to be embedded within an organization or initiative. And then also if the group is not diverse um, or inclusive in itself, um, then this can be problematic. Uh, and so I wanna ask uh, any staff that would like to share about um, what it looks like when it's not at the leadership level. Oh, I see, Robin, I see your hand. Yeah, so, she's about to say it looks like we have an audience question. Let me see if Robin wants to unmute. Hi. Um, yes, I worked for a nonprofit a few years ago and was head of the uh, Cultural Competency Renamed Diversity Committee. And we had a monthly managers meeting and I got this wonderful consultant to come and talk to all the managers and sort of present with this being a journey and it starts with us. And I watched after the regular business portion was finished as the executive director and all of the Eight assistant VPs left after the business section. Mm -hmm. So what did that communicate to all of the managers about the value of this wonderful consultant and her work? They were not a part of it. So that was pretty blatant. Yes, thank you for sharing that, Robin. I, I, I definitely have experience when it comes to um, leadership not exactly being on board and how that can be detrimental and often is problematic as you move forward and, and then want to bring in um, more work around diversity, equity, inclusion, and really don't have a starting point. I um, locally, I'm, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm a part of an initiative called ACE Nashville. And it is uh, something that we have had to work on internally as well with the um, the origin, our, our, our leading um, members were um, all white women. Um, and, and of course, as we move forward, we found that we really had to work on what it meant internally before we could get a lot of good work done. And what does that look like? Um, you know, obviously we needed some male energy <laughs> on our group. Um, we needed some racial diversity, but um, it can look very different because diversity, often we think about race, but it can be, um, you know, educational background. It can be whether or not you have lived experience or not. And so having um, leadership and steering committees that have a diverse background who um, know what equity looks like and are inclusive instead of exclusive, it's going to be very important. Um, and so that lack of leadership is our number two, um, you know, don'ts when it comes to, to DEI work. Um, go ahead, Raphael. Yeah, you know, with you bringing up um, lack of uh, leadership, it kind of, because I've been on some research projects prior to being with Aces Connection where we we were doing race work and um, socioeconomic, uh, low socioeconomic work, and we thought we were woke, but um, ha not having that in leadership with our PIs, I mean, it, it kind of translated to being assigned less to uh, desirable positions or um, areas mm -hmm. of the project, and also to being treated a little differently than my white um, colleagues. And so, I mean, it wasn't egregious and it wasn't, I don't think it was um, done to such a degree where it was completely damaging. It was damaging, but not completely. And so, yeah, I mean, just not seeing that in leadership did kind of trickle down to how the project um, developed and how it was carried out. So yeah, thanks for the time. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Carrie. I see. I see our friend Karen Johnson on this call, who 
who took us through um, Dare to Lead. And uh, that was great work. And I think it, it, it absolutely um, softened the earth, so to speak, for us to be doing what we're doing now, where we really, you know, took a good, hard, long look at ourselves. But um, yes, I too, Raphael, have been in organizations where uh, the, the, the underlings want one thing and the, 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 the chieftains want another thing. And when there's that gap, there's the opportunity for what we call, and, and, and what Brene Brown calls those parking lot conversations. And those are death because they build resentment, they build factions, they build the wokes and the non-wokes or the sharks and the jets or the whatever. And it just makes for um, a, an atmosphere of distrust. And, you know, we laid out a lot of stuff and laid bare a lot when we did that work with Karen and we learned how to quote unquote rumble. And, um, you know, it really, I think, helped move us forward to being an organization that puts um, the, the, the trauma, the fact that um, inequality and racism are traumas, um, you know, to put that front and center and forward. And, you know, we were right on time to have ourselves um, educated and, um, and ready to, to take that front and center as the world became more and more woke, which was a great thing. So yeah, thanks again for that, Kara, and for Jane and Gail putting that together for us. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Raphael. Okay, yeah, and I'd also like to add, you know, being on the other side of that coin now where leadership is like taking this um, seriously and, and taking it to heart. I mean, it's, it's wonderful, it's, it's great. So yeah, I just wanna give the other side of the coin too. And also, I didn't mention I'm Rafael Maravilla, ACES Connection Regional Facilitator for Central California and Network Manager. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for, for sharing that. And I thought about that too, Rafael, from your first statement. Um, when I was, well, I still am with ACE Nashville, but we really, we really did struggle, uh, especially as we brought in more diverse um, um, people to the leadership um, steering committee. And, um, and it was because of the structure that was already in place. And then those who came in really struggled to, to fit in. Um, and, and so I do think you know, that leadership piece is so important. And Gail, I saw your, your hand up. Yeah, um, I, so I'm Gail Kennedy with ACES Connection. And um, I, I think that we, I feel like we as an organization were sort of fits and starts addressing this. And yes, I do also wanna echo what Carrie said, we, I feel like we kind of started talking about it superficially. And then we realized if we didn't have psychological safety, if we didn't have a way to be, be honest and trusting with each other, then we weren't gonna be able to really have the right, the conversations we had to have um, as a group. And that's when we brought Karen Johnson in to help us with our trauma-informed work. Um, and sorry, my phone won't turn off. Um, and then after that work, then we came back. And I think that's when we became more serious about like what this really means as an organization, what it means for us to do this work as an organization. And, um, you know, the leadership that we have from Ingrid and Raphael and Don Danielle. Um, helped us move forward. And that's why we have these weekly, you know, we taught, we have a subgroup that meets regularly and we have some mandatory that everybody on the staff, we have education. So one thing I was gonna say from number one is not only is it not fits or I mean um, one-offs, but it's also we have to, um, we have to do our internal work and then we have to do like process work and we have to be re-educated. So there's work where we need to be educated about stuff and there's work where we have to pro do the process work. Yeah, thank you, Gail. Uh, I, and so just to recap, I saw a little bit of, uh, of what came through in the chat. So we're, we're on number two right now. Number two is lack of leadership. 
And, and so, and I think what um, ACES Connection staff members have really shown is that um, once leadership is on board um, and we have um, a very uh, good understanding of what's, what's important from leadership, then we can really move forward. And of course, going back to number one with the one-off trainings and meetings, like Gail said, um, you know, if we don't do the internal work um, that is a process, then we can't really get started on working with the public and working with the people that we serve. And so that was something that, that really did come up. Um, and when we first started to talk about this as a, as a group, um, you know, me and, and Danielle really did say, well, before we put out this <laughs> on the site, we have to do this internally. And so um, that really did help us to kind of get a grasp of, you know, where we stand as leaders um, so that we must educate and pour into ourselves first before we can then do the work in the, in the public realm. And so um, that leads us to number three, which is a lack of vision. Uh, and so, you know, what's the big picture? Where, what does it mean when we're uh, incorporating DEI work? Do we know what it means? Do we have the big picture ahead of us? What would the world look like? if we were really diverse and, and equitable and inclusive. Um, and so that lack of vision um, can really uh, have an, um, you know, can really stagnate your work. And, um, and it's especially important because when we think about vision around this, this issue, uh, what the reality is, is we have never seen our, it's at least here in America for sure, we have never seen you know, real diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? We don't, we don't even know what that looks like yet, right? It, we're, we're pushing forward, but we don't know what that means and what that looks like in real, in real life. And so vision is very important. Um, I want to give it over to, to staff, um, ACES Connection staff, to really share your uh, experiences when it comes to having a lack of vision around DEI work. I'll start us off. Um, my name is Danielle Prince, and I'm the community facilitator for the San Francisco Bay Area region. And, um, you know, we've kind of already started to have this discussion, but focusing on a couple of components, but that I think is probably coming clear to everyone that an overall vision is going to be a necessary starting place uh, to help avoid some, you know, some of these other challenges. And um, there's another, uh, an, another thread that I would consider inevitable, which is these um, are challenging conversations in American society even still, and you are likely to encounter resistance um, when this is addressed, especially when it hasn't been addressed before. And even when um, there's some agreement to take these steps, when the work is work actually begins, there can be resistance with a lot of consequences um, in particular, for the community, um, the community organizations which are offer the community initiatives, which are often um, volunteer, um, people are led by their passion to do this work, but not prepared for a conversation around race and equity. And one of um, DEI experts already recognize this because they experience this when they do work with organizations. But it's uh, as as Ingrid alluded to. The um, internal work is important and you, it's important to think about um, doing, have a vision for doing race and equity work that recognizes that talking about race um, and other equity issues um, is a skill. So um, as Ingrid said, you have to do the internal work and there, that means you have to do skill building. You have to prepare people to be able to have conversations. And that's, that skill building is, you know, things like how to, um, you know, sit with discomfort, you know, that's something that Gail mentioned. And we've definitely had that opportunity um, ever since we've started to dive in. And what I've seen in community initiatives has been that resistance and the, the consequence of not taking time for that vision of how you're gonna roll this out, how you're gonna treat it as a, a priority, um, we always set visions for things that we consider to be priorities. Um, the consequence, which I've seen in community initiatives, that I, including those I've helped to support, is a refusal. So there's, there'll be a start 
and it's so uncomfortable that now this is off the agenda. We're not even going to address this. Um, I've also seen mass exits, <clears throat> people um, just uh, get it becoming um, so uncomfortable that they don't want to be there, even if the group does persist. And the opposite where people, there's a refusal. And so people who felt that addressing these issues was important left the group, sometimes after many years of um, passionate involvement. So it's really important. And I don't want to leave the impression that uh, um, vision is something that you use as what could become an excuse to delay starting. I think you start, but you need to approach it as you would anything else that you felt was um, critical to the success of your endeavor. Uh, and not doing that, um, I've seen that, um, you know, kind of leave those, those collaboratives a little devastated because they lost people or um, they were unable to move forward. So I'll, I'll stop there. I'm sure other staff have um, their own experiences to share. Thank you, Danya. I see your hand up, Carrie. Well, I just wanted to say that, that, that it was two years ago that um, Jane and Sissy and um, I think Danielle was involved in our diversity, equity, and inclusion tool. And Ingrid, when she came, worked with us on that. And so we actually have a tool that helps organizations um, look at who are we missing here? Do we have people with lived experience? Have we um, touched on the LGBTQ plus um, community? Do we have all ages, all races, all socioeconomic groups? And, and, you know, having a tool such as that can take some of the fear out of groups um, making their list because, you know, you're going to look for who is like you. Are they there? But this makes it so much easier for people to say, oh, who is not here? Who, and, and, and it actually tracks who the contacts are. So if there is a shift in leadership, you've got a document that will guide you as to, you know, who, who was, who were the, the founding humans in this group. And um, so I think that takes a lot of the, a lot of the fear um, or some of the fear out of it, um, which is great. And then the widget that we put together after George Floyd was murdered last um, spring. Um, there are so many wonderful, uh, documents, articles, videos, resources, and that um, for, for groups to use. And, and I think we are very conscious of, of trying to give people what they need, and even in, you know, to the extent that we are modeling this here now. So let's just put in a plug for some tools. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, go ahead, Jane. I was just going to say, I put the link to our the blog that uh, Ingrid wrote about the diversity, equity, and inclusion tool. And in that blog post, there's a, uh, you can download the DEI tool and take a look at it. Thank you. And, you know, just to kind of um, piggyback off of what Carrie was saying about um, our process, um, I would also like to say that one way that really helps with creating vision is to create an equity statement. And so um, you might think that equity statements are just for corporations who had a flood of them when, when we had our kind of racial reckoning this, this, this spring and summer. But um, equity statements are a really good tool to provide that vision. Uh, and it helps you to outline what you want to work on, what uh, diversity, equity, inclusion issues you want to address. And then it can be, uh, it can work in the same way that, you know, a mission statement would. And it would, it can help guide you uh, in that larger vision. And then um, all of your work and efforts, you know, you can use your equity statement as a touchstone um, to determine if you're in the, in the right space. And so that is... Our, our third lack of vision. Um, and so our fourth one is somewhat similar, but it is a lack of strategy. And so often um, we know how important strategic planning is. Um, most 
um, initiatives, most ground roots movements have a strategic plan. However, when um, we think about uh, DEI work within those initiatives, they often do not have a strategic plan. And so it's important to think of what does it mean to make our vision happen in real life? It's going to take strategy. You're gonna to have to outline what your goals are. Um, and not only that, but you have to be able to either embed that in your current strategic plan or you need to create a separate one altogether. Um, and so, you know, a lack of strategy is extremely detrimental when it comes to uh, incorporating DEI work into the ACES movement and ACES initiative. Um, so I definitely want to invite any ACES staff, ACES connection staff to talk about, you know, what that lack of strategy looks like in real life. Go ahead, Jane. Um, I can tell you how it, it um, played out in, in the growth of ACES Connection. So um, when in this early days, I just had you know, a handful of maybe three, four, five people. And, um, and, I, was, and I was being very cognizant of, of saying, okay, I want a, a diverse um, uh, group of people who are working in ACES Connection. And I was successful at the beginning. And then things got really, really busy and I just forgot about paying attention to that rather than having that embedded in a strategy. And, um, and then suddenly, um, you know, uh, uh, I would say two or three years later, I turned around and looked and it's like almost everybody's white and, um, and everybody's a woman. And, you know, it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? And luckily, you know, it was Gail who said, uh, Jane, we need to pay attention to this. And so, so we started doing that. And, and as a result, we, we did all this work, you know, from getting Karen in, from having Ingrid and Danielle and Raphael um, uh, lead us in this, you know, it's just been really wonderful. Um, I'm not going to say that there haven't been some hard times, uh, because we all have to look at our, you know, all the things that we probably didn't wish we had done in our in our past, but um, but we have created a safe place so that we can talk about anything and and give people space for that. So I'm I'm pretty proud of that. Um, and um, the where and and looking back, you know, one of the things that I made sure. Um, that we did an ACES connection was to make sure we didn't have white faces on all of the all of the blog posts. So um, so that was embedded early, right at the beginning, because uh, coming from my journalism career, I was uh, I didn't like that um, that white faces were on all the all the uh, positive news and and um, uh, black or or um, or indigenous or whatever was on all the, all the bad news. And so at least that was embedded in um, and as a, as a directive that, and a, and a consciousness that, that, we, that we try our best to um, pay attention to. But um, so I was successful in one tiny little piece and then completely forgot it for everything else. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Thank you for sharing. Go ahead, Lori. I was just going to say, so I'm a staff reporter with ACES Connection, and I know one of the things, I think a lot of people, I mean, Ingrid, you brought up like, you know, a lot of the communities have white-led um, steering committees and what have you. And so in reporting, you know, one of the things that I think a couple things I want to say. First of all, we have a practice of looking at our vision and reading it out loud. And that really makes a difference to actually look at our vision and read it out loud. And we do that at a regular basis because it's sort of reaffirming. It's not like we just have words on a piece of paper and we've done that. That's another way in which I think it's important you know, when you're thinking about any kind of vision and having traction on it, we're all involved in so many things and we have so many things going on and that's a way to kind of bring it to the fore. But when I'm doing stories, so 
is one of the things, you know, I'm really um, making an effort to do, and I think is so central too, is when talking to people about the work that they're doing around raising awareness about ACEs and raising awareness about initiatives and solutions is like, well, how have you built in race and equity into that plan? You know, and to be able to kind of write about where people are in that journey. And I think that's something that occurred to me. Thank you, Lori. And um, I see your hand, Gail. Go ahead. Um, so back, like, I feel like some of the strategy means that we're thinking like uh, beyond. We're, got, we're thinking what's next and how to do this more and better and more integrated. And the, one of the things we're looking at is how can we di continue diverse? Like, can we not get into that situation? Because what happens is, oh, you know, we have a new project or need to expand and then we, are, are in a rush and then we hire people that are just like us, like that's been our experience. So we're trying to be very intentional about what our practices and policies are around hiring so that we are going to be getting, we, we're, we're being intentional about trying to continue that, the, the creating diversity in our workforce. Oh, and that's about having a strategy to do that. Yeah. Danielle, I see your hand and then I'll come to you, Carrie. Yeah, and um, Gail um, started talking about a specific practice um, and the, just the general issue of practices and policies. That's so important when it comes to strategy. Um, you will forget and you will get rushed, but if you've taken the time to, um, you know, first of all, to seek the guidance because you might not know, what to um, what to prioritize, but it needs to be integrated. If something is a value, it should be integrated into every single aspect. And so I recently discovered this for us at ACES Connection because we hired a new person, um, Natalie, who is our family and resources lead. And she heard about this great work we're doing in our work group. And she's like, how I've missed so much, how do I learn about it? And, and mm -hmm. she, she was wondering if there was something she could watch. And so then it occurred to me, we haven't, included this in our onboarding. And I have read and that um, it, when you're talking about the pr practices and policies, it's been enumerated that onboarding is a very important way to show that you value um, uh, race and equity and you know, all of these issues. And so now <laughs> we know um, we need to correct that and make sure anyone new entering our organization, it, it doesn't just kind of jump in and get lost, but actually has some type of orientation towards what our values are. In a very in an intentional and um, intentional way, and with resources, not just like learning as they go along. So um, this is an ongoing process um, to and, and just being willing when you notice those oversights to uh, to begin to remedy them. Yeah, yeah, that's a very important point, Danielle. Um, Carrie, you had your your hand up. I was just going to say that um, for some people. You know, we think of those 10 ACEs, and then we think of the four that um, Nadine Burke Harris added, but then, you know, there are a gajillion more. And when I first started, I didn't realize that, I mean, of course, racism is an ACE. So putting that lens on top of everything, I think, has been a tremendous help for us um, to to just be so conscious of that. And Dana Brown, who is another one of our um, staff members, she couldn't be on the call today because she does training. She's down in San Diego, but Dana's passion for, um, for anti-racism, for equity, for equality, uh, permeated everything that she did. Um, she's in an area where there are many Native American lands um, taken from Native Americans and she's just, deeply conscious of that spiritually but the um but just thinking of all the microaggressions and all the ways that we can be um has been 
and even as we write things like Laurie said, to just be sure that we're, we're adding that another voice to make sure that the, and, and two, I'm just gonna say the link that Jane put in that has the article that Ingrid wrote about um, equity and racism, the graphic on that article is really such a strong and powerful graphic that if y'all haven't clicked on that to look at it yet, I think that graphic really portrays what we're talking about um, as, as people, you know, try to say things are equal and, and they're just not. So um, take a look at that graphic. It speaks a thousand words. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, and so this ultimately leads to our, our number five, which is just an overall um, attitude that DEI work, diversity, equity, and inclusion is an afterthought. Um, and so even as we've talked about, you know, things that are done, even when we think about the ACEs study itself, um, that, you know, often when I talk about ACEs and when I'm presenting, I, I remind people that the initial study was done on a population that was about 85% white. They all had employment or were the spouse of someone who had full-time employment. They all had health insurance. They were mostly college educated. Uh, it is not reflective of the population of our country. Uh, and then, and if it was, we would probably find that the the, the uh, you know prevalence of ACEs would have been higher in that initial study. And so, you know, we have a lot of great science, and we have a lot of um, you know great interventions that are research based and evidence based, but um, are are often skewed by our inability to um, center equity and diversity and inclusive practices. And um, this is, you know, at our at our detriment um, because, you know, those interventions and um, all that effort, you know, it costs money. There's a lot of work behind it, and at the end of the day, it doesn't do what we want. It doesn't close the gaps. Um, it 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 does not um, get us to where we want to be, and that's because we are unable to acknowledge that we are racist or biased um, because we haven't done the internal work. Um, and then that then skews all of our external work. Um, and then we are at a loss as to why um, our, our efforts are not closing gaps. And then we begin to kind of blame the victim. Um, and, and this is a process that is very prevalent. It's, it's kind of par for course for our, our country here in America, for sure. Um, and it is embedded within all of our systems. And so this is, this is the norm and it's easy to get to this conclusion. Um, what's hard is to kind of turn things inward, to look at ourselves, to look at our own processes, to look at how our systems are not working um, and to acknowledge that kind of those root causes is around this issue of, of diversity and inclusion and equity. And so the fact that it's an afterthought um, really does a lot of damage um, to, our, to our communities, but then also internally, it, it does not allow us to do the good work that we want to do. Uh, and so um, I wanna now shift to like the solutions and open it up to the staff to, um, to share what has worked, uh, but I'm sorry, before that, let me recap. So number one, one-off meetings and trainings, don't do those. And you know, having a lack of leadership around this issue is number two. Number three is having a lack of vision, like what does um, an equitable world look like? What does an equitable society look like? Um, number four, having a lack of strategy. And then number five, which is our big one, having um, or have seeing DEI work as an afterthought as, as opposed to starting with that work. And so I wanna open it up to the staff to talk about um, what has worked uh, in their experience and then we'll open it up to the larger group for any questions. And, um, and so what, what comments um, do you have? Sorry, Ingrid. Um, I was just going to say, we've already talked about it, um, but just having our weekly meeting of the race and equity work group, I think has just been a, a great 
it's a stepping or starting stone for us because it's a place where everybody who's a, a member of the work group or just on our um, team can come and bring up any issues they see um, in the work we're doing or how we're doing the work or what the work is. Um, and it's just um, it's a safe place to talk about issues of identity or anything like that. So I think that's our first success. Yeah, that continuous ongoing work um, that is regular. We, we know that as things come up, we have a space where we can take it to to talk it out. Um, Danielle, I see you have your hand raised and then I'll come to you, Raphael. Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, just share one of the groups that I was thinking about when I was talking about the resistance that can come. Um, if you haven't embedded in your vision a way to prepare, you know, the many levels of preparing people for these conversations and integration into practice um, and hiring expertise to um, guide you through it because you recognize that it's not intuitive, but um, there's expertise involved. Um, one of the groups that had initially just shut down the conversation, I would say like the, um, the geographical and demographic um, uh, nature of the area um, just was definitely not used to this kind of conversation and it was very difficult for them and they just shut it down kind of right away after one member kind of threw it out there and um, this is this should be one of our objectives and so I had witnessed that and thought um, wow it's going to be really difficult because they're not even willing to entertain the conversation and I actually didn't come up with a solution and later I found that they have integrated um, DEI and the way that they approach their resilience initiative. And in um, uh, looking into it, I discovered that there's this really popular um, training group in the area that they had wanted to work with and they had been turned down a few times. And this group finally um, had the capacity, they've been turned down mainly because of capacity, but had the capacity and they said, well, we only work with you if you integrate DEI, we don't work any other way. This is integral to how we see doing trauma-informed work and resilience work. And that's that was what it took. <laughs> so sometimes, um, you know, just uh, be, ha making sure that all of us are doing this work, whether we're in initiatives or we're the service providers or whether we're the community members, um, making sure that this is a, a priority because you can influence others through, um, through modeling. Um, it, you know, that, that was a huge turnaround. And so if that group had been willing to negotiate and say, oh, well, maybe you're not ready, we can do these other components first, but they took a line like, well, you know, this is what we do. So if you want us, or maybe we're not for you. Having that kind of hard line can really help um, push people through that discomfort. So I just offered that since it's a real life um, solution that I've seen. Yes, thank you, Danielle. Um, Raphael, you had your hand up and then we'll kind of move into audience questions and comments. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to uh, build off what Jenna was saying, you know, being in an organization that now um, takes, uh, makes this important, it's, it's, it's great, you know, and um, not only does having our work group provide a safe space, but um, it also um, goes out into the rest of the uh, organization and staff who may not have the, um, be able to join us um, because of other comp uh, commitments. But it also, it goes out to them and where we can, I, I as a um, indigenous Mexican male, I feel valued and I feel safe to be able to share how I feel and not only how I feel, but like what's going on in communities of color or um, more marginalized communities. So having leadership and working with staff that um, brings importance to DEI is, it's, it's great, it's wonderful and it's working. I, in my opinion, thanks. Thank you, Raphael. I, I agree. And, um, and so as we get ready to move into um, questions that may be in the, um, in the chat or anyone who wants to speak up, I'll let Jenna um, moderate that. But I will say that one thing that has been very, very, very helpful is um, having processes around your mission. Um, so even your equity statement, your mission, your values, um, we read those in our in our weekly meetings. And so being able to take the time and read through those and oftentimes 
groups will make those, right? They will call in consultants. They will do a lot of work to construct their mission and values and, and equity statements. And then they become static um, because, you know, it's, it's there and it's done. And going through the process of reading them regularly allows us to think, oh, we, we're not doing this part or, or, you know, maybe we should change this to, to better meet the needs. And so it makes it a living um, document, a living statement. And that helps us to accomplish our mission around um, DEI work and, and trauma-informed practices. And so I'll, I'll leave, up. I'll hand it over to you, Jenna. Great, um, thanks Ingrid. So we have our first question um, from Maggie who I'm going to ask to unmute. Hi, thank you guys so much for doing this. This has been really helpful. Um, I am currently working uh, to put together a task force in my local area, which is more rural and conservative in general. Um, and we've had some hard clashes over the summer um, with some you know, Black Lives Matter rallies that happened here. And then in reaction to that, some of these flag waves or uh, Blue Lives Matter um, things that people have been doing. And then we had a proud boy presence out here doing some recruiting and things. So it's just a, it's a really extra contentious time, I feel like in our community. And um, one of the things that I have learned living out here for the past 10 years is definitely like, if you want the community to buy into something, you have to kind of have the police on board. And so um, this task force, is looking specifically at access and equity for um, social services in our area, just because there are so many barriers. And so um, we have police, fire department, um, some folks from the county, we have domestic violence service providers, like just a whole array of people who are all coming with different understandings, right, of what oppression means and looks like, the reality of racism in our community. Um, we also are very much predominantly white um, in this area. And so, I'm just wondering if you have advice in terms of me as the facilitator um, and a white woman in this process of how to make sure we can have these conversations knowing ahead of time that it's gonna be uncomfortable and it's gonna be hard. There's going to be resistance from some areas. And so like how to do that in a way that is honest and genuine and also brings everyone along with each other. <laughs> can I jump in? Um, I'm slow about putting links, but I will, after I say this, I will spend however long it takes me to put the link in the um, chat. But um, there, there are some great tools. Um, and I think that, um, again, investing in the expertise is really important where you can. Um, but there's a, a, there's a one particular um, trainer, Ken Hardy, who's a psychologist, um, and I've had the opportunity to take a few trainings and I'm in one right now um, that's more in depth, but um, he also created a tool and this is how I got to thinking about the fact that this is skill building. And he actually, you know, as a psychologist thought that through and created a resource, um, how to talk about race. And then he sort of breaks it down and he, and he breaks it down into tasks for people of color and tasks for white people. And it's really helpful, like it's very thoughtfully done and it emerged out of his own experience of people being really shut down in the conversation. He's like, well, what can I do to get people flowing? So I wanna share that tool. Um, but, and, I, and then I'll say once again, uh, expertise is really important. So where you can um, just bring someone in who can help you, it, this is, uh, it's not intuitive work. It's really um, people and people who do the work spend a lot of time um, deeply training and, cr and creating tools and that sort of thing that can help lead you. So that's that's one way. And they have answers to those kinds of questions that you raised. So now I'll, I will go find the tool. Yeah, and Maggie, that is a great question. Um, what has helped me um, in presenting and consulting around race is uh, history, um, which is very personal and, and you, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where you are in the world, but whatever your city, town, you all have history that is tied to, to race. Um, it's interesting to people who are from there. Uh, it's a great way to teach lessons. Um, and then it's, it's hard to deny the, the facts, right? And so 
um, history is very helpful in telling the story of a town or a city and often um, anywhere in this country, there it, it has racist origin. Um, and then I would also say that in, in what Donnie was talking about is like racial caucusing. And so you don't, you, you might think that you want to have everyone in the same room talking about this at the beginning and, and maybe not. Maybe you want to have a space that's white only safe, uh, white black only safe. Um, that allows you to, to have conversations. And this is kind of counterintuitive to what we've been taught about race. Everything that we've been taught about race is not correct. Um, we've kind of backed ourselves into a corner being PC or and also issues around liability when it comes to HR practices and things of that nature. But, um, you know, it's, you don't have to play by the rules exactly, especially when you're an initiative that's volunteer based and things of that nature. You can be a little bit more free and kind of craft uh, events that help people to get where they need to be. Um, and so, you know, history, book clubs, um, and then, you know, bring in consultants and, and um, people who are able to help with the kind of trainings that you may not be as skilled in. That is something that's important. Thanks for that question, Maggie. Uh, oh, Laurie, did you have something to add? I just wanted to piggyback on what Ingrid was saying and made me think of this book that we've read as a group called My Grandmother's Hands by uh, Resma. Um, oh gosh, I'm just blanking on his last name. Someone help me. <laughs> but um, he's also a psychologist and he does trainings around racial trauma and racism. And what he has said is that, you know, there's white body supremacy and there's like, you know, just in, in when you have and the body, the way that the body experiences trauma that everybody has that you really, it's hard to have people of color and white people in the same room who don't, who haven't been convening and talking about these things open up or feel anything except shut down so that you know was just one thing I wanted to add so that's also a book that might be useful just to kind of read and see what it says it's called my grandmother's hands Neil, did you have anything to add it looked like you might have a comment me? Oh, I was just, um, when Laurie was like, oh, I forgot his last name. I'm okay. like, writing, I'm putting the link right there. So it's in the chat. I was writing in the chat. I'm sorry, but I have to jump off for another call, but this is wonderful. Um, thank you all for, for being here. And thank you, ACES Connection Team, for leading this. Thanks, Gail. Um, so thanks for that question, Maggie. Um, we did get a question in um, from Ramona, who, um, can't unmute herself right now, so I'm going to read her question for her. Um, so this is a question from Ramona Danielson, and she said, I tried to identify a microaggression in my office, not directed to me, but was told by leadership I misunderstood. Wondering how to help draw attention to microaggressions is real. My leader is woke, but also stretched and distracted. Ingrid? Yeah, I think this is this is something that um, is very pervasive question. Everyone wants to know how to deal with microaggressions. Um, this is definitely the space where that, where that groundwork should have already been done, right? And so trauma-informed practices help us to understand that when someone raises a concern that because they are valid, that means that we entertain their concerns. Uh, and so this is more of an issue of, of trauma-informed um, practices. And that as we have trauma-informed workplaces, then we can have real conversations about microaggressions and anything else. This is about a lack of um, psychological safety. And then often when, when, and this is another way when we say that we are trauma-informed and yet in practice, we may, we may not be there. And so um, I would just say, again, that, going through the process of becoming trauma-informed um, will be something that is helpful to be able to have real conversations around race, 
and, and microaggressions and things of that nature. Um, and, and this goes back to education as well. There are, there are plenty of books around microaggressions. Um, microaggressions are, you know, they're insidious. They, even when considered positive, just the fact that they're ongoing and persistent and constant for people of color, uh, and not just people of color, microaggressions impact lots of different groups, um, but they should be taken very seriously. And in a trauma-informed workplace, they, they would be. And so um, I would say, again, trauma-informed practices are very important in workplace settings. Great, thanks, Ingrid. Does anybody else have any other questions? You're welcome to raise your hand and I can unmute you. Any last questions? We did plan this to go for another half an hour. Yes, uh, Adriana, uh, if anybody would like to save the chat, you can click the three buttons in the bottom right hand corner. Um, and I will put my email address in case anybody wants to email me for a copy of the chat. Karen, there we go. I just unmuted you. Thank you, Jenna. Um, I just wanted to congratulate the ACES team, ACE, uh, ACES Connection team. You, you really, these guide point, guide posts that you've shared are really what you do every day. And that's that's pretty, pretty neat to watch. Um, I, I think um, the psychological safety, you know, the, the missing that to be where organizations um, aren't able to sit with the difficult conversations or don't understand the tools to make those happen, as Danielle noted, often can um, make these efforts um, be uh, shut down or become not, not moved into the strategic plan, as you've noted, or not be embedded into real life. And you've really done that. The one, the one thing I'll say about, about your work is, even with book studies, you have figured out ways to take those book studies into real life because sometimes a book study can also be a one-off in that it's it involves various meetings. It can involve six meetings, but then it's left on the shelf. And I think your work, um, it demonstrates how to not do that with these weekly meetings that you do and the intentionality of how you bring it to everything you do every day um, is very impressive. And just thank you for, for these various points you've shared. Raphael, oh, sorry, Raphael and then Carrie. Hi, so um, looking back at the projects I was on and how leadership um, did not have DEI like in mind, how um, as someone affected by it, would you bring it up to leadership and have them recognize it as something important? Yeah, that's a great question, Raphael. I think, um, and, and I think this goes back to my answer that I had before around trauma-informed practices um, and having them ingrained in, in what it looks like to have procedures that are trauma-informed. And I think that Raphael's question and the question before around um, microaggressions and even the, the one that's being posed around disabilities is really highlighting how um, there may be a limited view of trauma-informed care and trauma-informed practices and that we often think about it as something that we provide as a service. So we are a group, we're serving this community, we're going to enact trauma-informed practices, trauma-informed procedures to enact, to interact with this community that we're serving and not doing that internal work. And, um, and that is, um, I think that is really at the root of a lot of issues around the intersection between DEI and, and, and the ACES movement uh, is that we are not seeing racial trauma or, um, you know, 
exclusivity as as an ace and it is so one of the core understandings that we have around aces science is that our relationships help us to um, build resilience and to be more resilient and we think that means you know that limited view of you know your relationship as a, as a child with an adult kind of, you know, as a buffer against adversity. And it's not, that's not the case. It's really any relationship to include your coworkers. Um, but we have kind of, um, as a society and also our understanding of trauma-informed care and practices, we've kind of, um, you know, separated that into, a, you know, intimate relationships or family. Um, but as we, incorporate trauma-informed practices into workplaces, into our, into all of our one-on-one -on -one interpersonal interactions, then we will work to address microaggressions. We'll work to address um, racial issues, um, issues around disabilities. Um, and so this is really um, not a cure-all, but it doesn't have to be just one, the one way that you view it around uh, childhood relationships as a buffer against childhood trauma. Uh, all of our relationships help us to build resilience and, um, and are a protective factor, including the ones with your coworkers and with your, your uh, supervisors and bosses and the people that you volunteer with, all of those relationships. And so if we approach, um, if we approach being trauma-informed in that way, um, then we can address most of our society's illnesses to include racism and any other way that we exclude others. And I hope I'm answering all of those questions at one time. Thank you, Ingrid. I think that sounded like a great answer. Carrie, did you have another question to ask? No, I was just going to say, and I put it in the chat, that um, what a great resource my grandmother's hands has been. And I, I listened to it. Um, an, a, a Black actor named Carrie Height narrates it. And he does such a great job narrating it. And how invaluable that book um, can be to uh, law enforcement people. It's, it's not a hard read. It's a, it's a, it's a compelling read. Um, you know, it's, it's not a, um, and I guess that, that might sound classist to say that. I need to watch my language, you know. Um, <laughs> we just have to watch it. But, it. but the stories that it tells makes it so relatable, um, the examples that he gives and the exercises that he gives in the book make it so relatable. Um, so anyway, that, that's just my two, two cents on that book, which we all love. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, and Carrie, one of, I think one of the reasons why that book resonates with a lot of people is that Men It Comes to Work is, is body-centered. Uh, and this is one of the ways that we know that race is such a, um, a hot button issue, right? Is that the way that we physically respond to the topic, right? We, we will have, um, you know, very irrational responses to um, discussions around race and racism. And it's because the um, we have, all of us, not just people of color, we all have racial trauma. We've been traumatized by, the, um, by race and racism to the point where even the discussion or bringing up the topic is enough to raise our blood pressure and get us, you know, get us to yelling and, and be, you know, having, activating our, um, fight, fight, or fees response. And so you know, that's just an indication that we all need to heal when it comes to race and, and racism um, and exclusion in general um, and how we've kind of stigmatized certain groups and been exclusionary towards certain groups. And that has led to a lot of guilt and shame. And it's also led to a lot of trauma and so we all have kind of this, um, you know, like, yeah, like PTSD around, around the issue of race. And which means that we need to do the work to create psychological safety, to have conversations. Um, and, and that's where the real work is going to be, that internal work um, with your coworkers so that you can do the best external work that you can.
Great, thanks. Are there any um, last questions from anybody? I'd be happy to unmute you if you have any questions to ask or feel free to put them in the chat and I can read them. Um, if, oh, you do have one question, Graciela. Let me see if I can find you. Okay, just um, ask to unmute you. Hi, um, thank you so much for, for a great presentation. My question is to Cheryl. Um, uh, um, she put on the chat that um, she has missed, I can't find that. Uh, she has missed a bunch of opportunities to, um, where was it, oh goodness. Uh, a bunch of opportunities to, I'm sorry, I cannot find the original trying to find it too. I found it. This conversation was super helpful oh. and has me reflecting on a number of missed opportunities and ways we can do better work moving forward. Yes, uh, at some point she talked about uh, opportunities that she missed and I want to know to give, to give me a couple examples if possible. Sure. Cheryl, did you want to um, unmute yourself and give some examples? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I think that we have potentially missed some opportunities to engage in smaller group race specific conversations to give people a, a safe space and not um, not acknowledge that in a in a large mixed group, they might be less willing um, particularly among peers where they're concerned about how they might be perceived or how their comments might be perceived, um, not necessarily willing to, to share what they what they might otherwise. So that's 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 one example. Um, I also liked um, a lot of the talk about the intentionality of mission statements and repeating mission statements out loud and revisiting mission statements. Um, having the right people in the room when you're crafting mission statements so they don't come from one specific side. Uh, all, all of that just has my mind, um, I have ADD, I should admit, but it's got my mind sort of blowing up on, on opportunities missed and, and some things that we, could, that we could do differently moving forward. Yeah, I think that Cheryl, what you're talking about, I think is kind of in response to what me and Danielle were talking about before about racial caucusing, like not all conversations have to be in a space where it's everyone all together. Um, and, you know, what does it look like to craft some kind of, kind of intentional um, discussions and in a way that um, is, doesn't fall into, you know, oh, this is a whites only discussion <laughs> where people feel excluded. But that um, I think that if you can um, get the wording right and create those type of spaces for people, then they are often beneficial to have real conversations. Um, but I will say that as you create those spaces or if you engage in racial caucusing, I think it's a good practice to do all three. So you can have spaces, safe spaces for people of color, safe spaces for white people to have conversations, but then you also need to have um, some a space where you can bring people all together to have those conversations too. But when you have those conversations that are where everyone is together, you need to have already laid the ground with some um, with, of psychological safety before you have those conversations when everyone is together. And, and you still may not get the response that you want. I've, I've done plenty of presentations around race where no one has questions, but until after it's over and then everybody emails me. Um, and so you, you just have to keep having those ongoing conversations and as people get more comfortable, you know, then you can have more meaningful conversations over time, um, especially as people have to kind of, you know, have time to process um, as well. And so it, that is very common. That happens a lot where people are in shared spaces and no one will have a question or no one will say anything. Um, when you know that there are questions there and, and, and uh, people just, that is an indication that people don't feel safe around this topic just yet. Great, thanks Ingrid. Um, I think we have time for um, maybe one more question if anybody has one. 
or if not, um, Ingrid, if you have any final words to wrap us up, and then we have an announcement from um, Raphael and one from me. Last call for questions. Well, I want to thank everyone for being engaged and participating. Um, we will have more um, throughout the year from the Race and Equity Worker where we will share our process and then also open it up for discussion to the larger group. So be on the lookout for at least um, three more sessions this year. And so again, thank you for, for coming and being attentive and being open. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. And then I'm just gonna pass it over to Raphael who has a quick announcement. Hi everyone. So I've been working on an anti-racism newsletter for Racist Connection, which will be debuting on the last Friday of this month. So I can capture things from Black History Month and it will be um, distributed and published every last Friday of the month. So if you're interested, I have um, added to the um, chat, the sign-up document. So, and it, I'm, I'm pretty sure Jenna is going to be distributing it with the recording of this event as well. So if you're interested, uh, just go ahead and sign up. It's gonna include news articles, resources, um, and events. And it's gonna to continue to evolve to um, address needs that I may not address in the initial offering. So yeah, go ahead and sign up. And also you may reach out to me. Um, I will add my um, email in the chat as well. So yeah. Sign up. Thank you. Thanks, Raphael. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. It was a great conversation, and we appreciate you being here.